My first church was in Green Valley, Arizona, as I've told you uh, over the last 10 years, uh, several times. Um, what kind of community was it? Do you remember? A retirement community. Yes, I was a youth pastor in a retirement community. I took that job. I still can't believe I did it. Uh, and it's this kind of a, a humorous anomaly. That's where God led us when I left the uh, PhD program in Hebrew at Dallas Seminary. Uh, they hired me as a youth pastor, of all things. Um, and uh, so all the, you know, all the young people that ran the city uh, lived outside of town and, uh, and they needed a youth pastor. So there, there I was. I was also Christ, Christian education director at the church. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, putting together all the teaching of the church for the adults. So it was a very uh, balanced, challenging job. Uh, and, and the church was a snowbird community, meaning uh, it was basically wealthy people from the East Coast uh, who owned a second home in Arizona. And so when they would leave the snow of the winter and enjoy the beautiful desert of Arizona uh, during the winter and then go back home. Uh, and so our church would actually double in size. The city doubled in size uh, every winter. Uh, it, was, it was an amazing place to live. I met all kinds of people there. Uh, I met um, Walt Porter, uh, was one of our parishioners. He drew the maps for the D-Day invasion. Uh, great man of God. Um, he had a special needs son. It was fun to sit and just learn from Walt what it meant to walk with God. Um, we had the vice president of McGraw-Hill Publishing went to church there. It was one of our teachers. I mean, just that kind of church. Um, they challenged me. I was 27 years old, and I had much to learn there. But one of the couples that I ran into there that I found most amazing uh, was a very quiet couple, uh, very humble, didn't say much. Uh, their names, I'll never forget them, uh, George and Elsie Hopper. Uh, when Liz would uh, go to California to see uh, her twin sister and family, uh, go to San Diego, uh, uh, you know, I would, uh, they, would, they were the kind of couple who would have me over for dinner. Uh, and the first time I went over to their house for dinner, George had been an engineer uh, who, um, I forget if he worked for Boeing or whoever he worked for, but he, he was uh, stationed in Iraq of all places back when you could freely roam Iraq and nothing would happen to you as an American citizen. Imagine. Uh, and, he, and he told me when I went over for dinner, he said, I, uh, uh, as an engineer helping the Iraqi government, they let me go anywhere I wanted to go, uh, take picnics at the Babylonian archaeological site, take whatever I wanted. You're kidding me. Yeah, he said, uh, you want to go in my office, you can see some artifacts that I, that I took, and it was in my luggage. And I brought it back. I'm, so I, I'm, I'm going in his uh, office. I just left the PhD program. So I'm really big into, you know, everything Hebrew, everything Old Testament. So I, I went um, into his office. Uh, and there's, you know, there's all kinds of things in there from the Babylonian era. And there was a, it was a small obelisk there. You know what an obelisk is? How many do not know what an obelisk is? Okay, don't be afraid. Yeah. Um, an obelisk is uh, like a stone, a multifaceted uh, stone. Uh, multiple angles on it, and it's tall, usually has a point on it, uh, and they, they would use a stylus pin when it was uh, uh, like wet, like clay, uh, to use like a, a stylus pin to, to carve Babylonian cuneiform in there to record the actions of kings and things like that. Then it would dry, when it would dry, it'd be hard. You have a, a, a listing of your battles and your glory in battle and things like that. He had one on his desk. <laughs> you ever seen one? Like a real one? Yeah, he, he had this, and he's like, could you translate that? Uh, hey, Fresh out of Babylonian cuneiform. Huh. Um, yeah, we called it the trumpet language when I started the, the doctoral uh, study, and, but I never finished the program uh, because of my Nathan's autism. Uh, so I would have learned it, but I, could, I couldn't translate it, but I knew what it was. But a great couple. Um, I learned a lot about them having dinner with them, but uh, I learned the most about them one night when they shared their testimony in an evening service. It was Southern Baptist Church. There was church every Sunday night. And I went with the family. I was probably 27, 28 years old. And George and Elsie were going to share their personal testimony. I was not prepared for what I would hear. Uh, they shared about how they had four children. I think it was four sons. Uh, and they shared about how they had lost three of them during the Vietnam War. And I was stunned. I was listening to them. They were full of joy. I'd only ever seen peace about them. I'd never picked up bitterness from them at all. Great people of the faith. And if I remember correctly... Because uh, it was a long time ago. That was, what, 1986, 87 uh, back then. Um, I think two of their children were lost in the war itself. And I think one was lost in an accident. But three of them out of four. You know, you would think if you were the parent, uh, you would have major issues with that, would you not? That you'd be angry at God. You'd be bitter. Uh, you wouldn't be in church serving. Um, but they were there all the time, full of joy. And they're kind of people you just wanted to be around. How'd they have that kind of hope? That's what I wanted to know. 
How'd they have that kind of hope? Well, they had that kind of hope because they believed in the sovereignty of God. They followed him no matter what. And that God had given them their children and God had taken their children away. And like Jonah uh, does in Jonah chapter one, I think it's verse 30. He says, God has given, God has taken away. Blessed is the name of the Lord. They were those kind of people. When George contracted um, terminal uh, cancer, uh, multiple tumors on his liver, uh, I would go to his house to pray for him. Uh, I was about 29 at the time. Uh, and I would go to his house to pray for this dying man. And, uh, and I would walk out to my car and think to myself, I went in to encourage, and he encouraged me. That's amazing kind of Christian right there. He had hope, amazing hope. How do you have that hope? Uh, they, they gleaned that kind of hope uh, in facing adversity from uh, verses like Romans 8, 28. What does it say? You probably have it memorized. All things do what? Work together for the good. Well, to those who love God and follow God, who are called according to his purpose, all things work together, even the loss of children. They understood that. And as we've been following Paul, who also understood adversity and loss, I mean, think of all the things that had happened to him. A shipwrecked, uh, left for dead, uh, stoned, uh, you know, all the things that had happened to him. He's writing about the hope of God as you fight the world, the flesh, the devil. And that's what this chapter has been about uh, since verse 18. It's calling, giving you all the reasons why you as a Christian, like the hoppers, uh, should not be one who's hopeless but hopeful. Uh, and he's given us uh, multiple reasons, four to be exact, that we need to review that uh, maturing Christians want to know. So if your little spiritual ship is adrift on the ocean of adversity and your sails limp, uh, well, God wants to put some wind into it today by helping you remember why you should be full of hope like the hoppers. Reason number one, this is a, a test, is it not? I could blank this out and you would all know these things, would you not? Right? I'll talk about lying next week. Uh, <laughs> Reason number one, why should you be helpful? Trials. Trials lead to triumph. The hoppers knew that. You took away son number one, son number two, son number three, but God, we will still follow you because we know that you're providential and, and all things one day will lead to triumph one day because that's just the kind of God you are. Number two, cosmic degradation. This old sinful world is heading downhill, is it not? We lost paradise because of our fall. We're going to regain paradise when Christ appears. Who could not be hopeful over that? Point number three, personal consternation, anxiety over life when you're dealing with the world, the flesh, the devil, leads to personal transformation. Why? You have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. He's constantly breeding hope in your life that, nah, this isn't all there is. There's more yet to come. And then lastly, we talked about um, reason number four, you should be hopeful. When you're praying, he's praying. Who's the he? Holy Spirit. Where is he? He's with you. He's with you. So you're praying, God, let your will be done. I lost this child. I lost the second child. I lost the third child. God, give me wisdom in this. What's he doing? Oh, no. No, he's groaning with you at the loss. He's mourning with you. But he's also praying to the Trinity, inside the Trinity. It's the mystery of the communication within the Trinity. And they're talking about you and, and how God's will can be fulfilled through your prayer life. Do you think the Holy Spirit ever prays out of the will of, of the Trinity? No. And what that means is uh, what God's will is for your life is going to be evidenced. You keep praying and his will shall be done and, and you'll be amazed that that will is, is, is done in a, in a, a surprising fashion. What um, he, Paul shows us uh, in, in the next verse, verse 28, is reason number five why you should be hopeful in life. And this is what the hoppers uh, wrapped their heart and their mind around as they dealt with tragedy in their life. Uh, it is that God's working in all things. Notice the different translations. How many have the King James? Don't be afraid. Uh, well, it's a trick question. No. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Let's stop and pray for those people right now. No. <laughs> That's a great translation. This is very close. They call it a wooden translation because it tries to follow the, the Greek text. So it comes out a little more stilted. The NIV is easier to read because they kind of smooth the translation out a bit. And so the King James, great translation. Here's what it says. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. But the NAS or the New American Standard Version, that's what I use, um, it says this, and it's different, a little different. It says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, which sounds very similar to the New International Version if that's what you happen to have. What's the variance between the two? Well, the first one, it's got all things doing the working out of all the things in your life. Hmm. The other one has God taking control of all things. 
Now, if you study this from a textual critical standpoint, um, which I won't get into all the details because you would probably pass out on me, but I will, <laughs> I will mention them to you because this is one of those places that's kind of important. There's a textual problem in here from the ancient text because you want the most ancient manuscript evidence for said translation. And so when you go to grad school, they teach you how to do textual criticism, etc. Sometimes it's important, sometimes it's not. Here I think it's important just from a theological perspective because one translation has all things doing things in your life. I have to ask a question. And that, that has the best ancient textual support. Where it's not God in control, it's all things in control. But think about that logically. Is all things anything? What say this section? <laughs> they're so spiritual, they're so quiet. We're meditating, we're looking for the answer. Do all things really do anything? No. It's like, it's an abstract concept, is it not? So therefore, I will not opt for the, the translation, which has the best translation evidence to, to leave God's name out of the subject of that sentence and put all things there. Uh, but I think just for logical purposes, based on the context of God being the center of the, the contextual argument of Paul, that it's better and logically more consistent to just assume God's in control of the all things. So when you look at your life, Paul says, well, NAS, and we know that God causes all things to work together. And we'll get into the synergism, because that's the word he uses there in Greek. We'll get into the synergism of that next week um, uh, for those who love God. And so he, he works it out to the, be the good. And Paul says, um, it's all things. It's the Greek word panta, all things. Means, what does that mean? All things. But see, what happens when things happen in our life we don't like, all of a sudden, well, I don't know if it's all things in this situation. No, oh, God, it's all things, all things. And Paul says, uh, we know this to be true. Now, this is very interesting. You can't say this in your English translation. In your English translation, if you look at it grammatically, it just looks like a present tense verb. And we study verbs at our church. Why? You're all new? They're inspired. Remember the inspired word of God? Every jot and tittle, smallest stroke of the, you know, the Hebrew pen, etc. Um, so the fact that he chose a perfect tense here, not a... Present tense verb is highly important. Why? Because perfect tense isn't used very often in Greek. So whenever you see it, you must ask yourself the question as a grammarian, why did they choose the perfect? Here's the definition of the perfect tense, grammatically speaking. A, a past act with an abiding, uninterrupted result. Mm, that's interesting. If I say, we know something in the perfect tense, I'm saying, I, Paul, I as a Christian know this fact about God Almighty and it continues to infinity and nothing can change it. What's he talking about? He's talking about the providence of God. That in every single facet of your life, from things triumphant to things tragic, all things he's God working out his purposes to your good, not your evil. Do you believe that? That's what he's talking about. But uh, I want to make sure that we really understand the providence of God. So that's why I want to slow down. Because sometimes we don't understand the providence of God. In fact, I think a lot of theological problems can be resolved when you understand the providence of God. And a lot of problems in life, the sting can be taken out of them and insight and wisdom can be gained as you understand who God is as he's speaking about his providence. So we want to look at two things this morning. Number one, providence defined. And then secondly, we'll look at a distortion of providence which pervades our world today. So we'll, let's start out with defining terms. Providence, what does that mean? I had one definition of my notes, and you can read them online tomorrow if you want to look on this resources page under sermon resources. You'll see the PDF version of all my notes. I have one definition here that after I read it this morning when I got up at 6 o'clock, I read it and I thought, what did that just say? Ever read anything It's like so deep it's over your head? Like this sermon? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So I'm, uh, so I'm going to opt for the easier definition from J.I. Packer about the providence of God. Remember we're defining terms? Thank you. You're so interactive. I love it. <laughs> Providence is, according to J.I. Packer, the unceasing activity of the creator whereby in an overflowing bounty and goodwill, he, as God, uploads his, uh, uh, upholds his creatures in ordered existence, guides and governs all events, not some, all circumstances and free acts of angels in the unseen world and men and directs everything to its appointed goal for his own glory. God has a plan. We'll get into that next week. Or maybe the third week. We'll get there. God has a plan for your life. He's working it out because he loves you. And he'll work through the tragedies and times of triumph to accomplish his goal. He's there for all things because he's providential. He never looks at your life and goes, uh, uh-oh. 
He never, he's never caught by an angel. Hey, Lord, you were kind of napping when that happened to so-and-so. He never, he never gets caught. You think God gets caught napping? Does God nap? No, because no, there's no night or day. And he never gets tired, right? Not like us. No. Uh, so he's in providentially in control of all things. Now, here's how Norman Geisler puts it in kind of a syllogistic argument. He says, when you think about the character of God, God is all what? He's all good. What's the ramification of that? He desires good for all things. That's his nature. Uh, God is all-knowing, therefore he knows all things. Never play tri trivia with him. He always knows the answers. Uh, God is all-wise, which means he knows the best way to the best end for all things. You may think you're wiser in, in any given situation, but you might as well check your wisdom at the door. He's wiser than you, right? Because as he says in Isaiah, my thoughts are what? They're not your thoughts. They're higher than your thoughts. That doesn't mean you can't think. But God says, uh, well, I know more than you do. I'm wiser than you. And then he says, God is all-powerful. He's omnipotent, which means he can do all things that are possible. Therefore, the summation of the syllogistic expanded argument is what? God provides the best means to the best end for all things he has created where you're concerned. You lost three children. Does that apply? Yeah. I may not understand it. And God may give him wisdom and insight. Sometimes God gives you wisdom and insight. He's done it for me in a way that's profound, that you, you know it's him. He helped you understand a tragedy. And then sometimes he does not, which I just leave that for heaven. I know when I see him face to face, I'm going to look at the things in my life I did not understand. And at that point, I'm, I'm going to be going, oh yeah, now I get it. How wise you are. Wisdom, the providence of God. He controls all things. Uh, Randy Alcorn uh, says in his book, uh, The Problem of Evil, he says this. God's sovereignty is the biblical teaching that all things remain under God's rule and nothing happens without either his direction or permission. God works in all things for the good of his children. Then he quotes Romans 8, 28. And then he says, these all things include evil and suffering. God doesn't commit moral evil, but he can use any evil for good purposes. Think about the cross of Christ. Talk about evil. They just killed the Messiah. And what do you think the devil and his minions did when they crucified the Messiah? In their realm, they're high-fiving each other. They finally did it. Boy, did they. God took the evil of the cross and said, oh, no, he just died for the sins of all mankind. And they had a little problem three days later. Did they not? You understand Easter? He rose from the grave. He was the victor. So God can take even the evil things of your life and turn them to great things. It's, 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 it's his providence. He's in control of all things. Now, there's, the scary part of preaching is God makes you learn it as you go along. I'm, no, I'm serious. And just when I thought I had providence down, Thursday happened in my life. <laughs> Thursday, what, I finished my sermon on providence. All things work together for those who love God, blah, blah, blah. I had that all down. I go home. I'm ready for dinner. Liz is a wonderful cook. And, uh, and she's like... Uh, uh, there's, there's been an issue. Huh? Like since I talked to you last, the, early this afternoon? Yeah, there's an issue. Uh, you know, she, I was busy cooking something, uh, and I went out into the garage. I heard an explosion in the house. Uh, I, I went and scared the dog to death. I, I went inside the, the kitchen. The whole house is full of smoke. Something's on fire. What's going on? Blah, blah, blah. We lost the stove. <laughs> it just blew up. I mean, God, I got the sermon illustration. Do I need one that's m new? Guess I did. So I walk in. It's like, I guess there's no dinner tonight. I mean, it's just uh, fried the stove, huh? Yeah, wow. Um, so, you know, uh, she had to open all the windows. It's freezing cold outside. Turn fans on to get the smoke out of there so we can breathe, etc. So, you know, I got to do the man thing. Pull the, you know, pull the unit away from the wall. It's all black from fire hitting it. The back of the unit's all black. This is not a good sign. And I made the logical deduction, based on the fact this thing's at least 12 years old, it blew up, probably not worth repairing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I looked at her and I said, hey, I think the most logical thing, since I'm a logical guy, Aristotelian logic tells you it's time to go shopping. So we went shopping. It had to be black because everything else in the kitchen is black. <laughs> They've now switched to stainless steel? <laughs> what is the deal? So we go out looking. No, oh, can't find anything. You've got to be kidding. So we wound up at Sears. Um, and um, it was a Kenmore that we had. All of our appliances basically are. And uh, so we wind up at, you know, and we're looking at all the units. You know, is this available in black? No. How about that one? Nope. How about that one? Nope. Are you kidding me? God's trying my faith in Sears. It's unbelievable. And then, 
um, I'm remembering my sermon, by the way. Uh, God is providential. And then there's one on the end cap that, that, is that one available? Yes. And it's more, one of the more expensive ones. Go figure. Uh, <laughs> Some kind of demonic ploy somehow. Uh, and it's on the end cap. This is our most powerful this and that. Blah, blah, blah. And I, Does that come in black? Yes. Your lucky day. It comes in black. Mm -hmm. it, and that one happens to be not on sale. Great. Oh, and you got you to gotta buy the plug to make it work. Huh? Who thought that up? Anyway, I got to share some of my frustrations as I go along. I'm like, okay, $30 for the plug. Okay, it's like buying a car. and Oh, it didn't have a carburetor. Oh, sorry. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, I got to get back to my sermon. I'm drifting. So we buy this thing. It's in black, blah, blah, blah. They deliver it, you know, plug it in. And, uh, and so Liz is all excited. I'm upstairs typing yesterday after they got it all put in and she turned it on. She wants to make, she loves to make cookies. She makes excellent cookies. So she's all excited because she could cook multiple stacks of cookies at the same time because it's a convection oven. She never had a convection oven. So she's arrived. Uh, so I'm up there typing and I hear, Marty, you've got to come down here. Like, what, did it blow up again or something or what? So I go down there. She goes, this is amazing. Two sheets of cookies at the same time. It's amazing. And they tasted really great, too. They, it was providential for me to try one. Um, but, uh, but as I was cleaning the top of it, because you had to put the special cream on it to condition it for the first time. So I'm you know, putting that on there, and I'm like, whoa. Open in the little corner is kind of like a little something on the glass. I didn't, what is that? So I was trying to scrape it off and it won't come off. And I scrape a little bit harder. I don't want to scratch it. It's new. And then I'm looking at it. It's like, oh, it's like the letter K. Huh? On the top of my stove in the corner? Like, what's that about? She's reading the book over in the family room. Well, this is amazing. Come over here. Read the book when you buy something. She, I, <laughs> go, she goes, come here. So I went, over, I went over into the family room and she said, you're not going to believe this. She, she goes, that little K? That case, she goes, look at this page. She goes, this is a Shabbat stove. Huh? Jewish side of her family. You know what I'm saying? What do you mean a Shabbat, a Sabbath stove? Really? What? Are you kidding me? Which means, and she reads me the directions. If you program it the night before, a Friday night before Shabbat happens, and you can't do any work because thou shalt not do any work on Shabbat. It's a Jewish stove. <laughs> Her great-grandfather was Abraham David Solomon. <laughs> That's unbelievable. I mean, I'm just like, God, this is the most amazing message on providence, I mean, that you have given me lately. Thank you for letting me spend that money on this Shabbat stove <laughs> that I'll never use. Isn't it amazing? Is God providential? Yes. Yes. So I tell you something tragic, the Hopper story, and then I tell you something humorous. Why? God's providence is all those. Remember? All things, even when you're having to buy that stove on a Thursday night. But a lot of people don't understand providence of God, and I know that to be the case. Uh, one of them is Rabbi Kushner. Uh, he has a distorted view of the providence of God. Uh, he lost his son uh, years ago as a little boy, and because he had such a hard time thinking through God who took his son, he wrote a book about his theological observations of God taking his son. And the title of the book has sold 4 million copies. And it's called, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. 4 million people have read that book. Jews and Goyim, the Gentiles, have read that book. Uh, here, are, his observations in this book are very interesting. If you asked Rabbi Kushner, do you believe in God? Oh, yes. Did he create all things? Mm-hmm, he did. But here's his viewpoint of God. It's called finite Godism, G-O-D-I-S-M. Finite Godism means you believe God exists, and you believe he created all things, but he's not in control of everything, and things kind of get out of his control sometimes and catch him off guard. Huh? Now, I've read this book, and here's some excerpts from it. Quote, but if we can bring ourselves to acknowledge that there are some things uh, God does not control, then many good things are possible. Huh? What do you mean to come to the conclusion that God's not in control of everything. Why would I not believe that? Isn't God, by definition of who he is, in control of everything? And if he wasn't in control of everything, is he God? Well, no. He goes on to add, quote, Are you capable of forgiving God even when you have found out that he is not perfect? Excuse me? Do you write in your books when you read? <laughs> I do. And now that I got an iPad, I'm typing the note feature all the time. What in the world? You... 
I got to forgive God because I think he's not perfect. How can he be God if he's not perfect? And how do I know what perfect is if there's not a perfect God to measure an imperfect God against? Therefore, there must be a perfect God, right? Did, did you understand what I... You follow me? How can I know the line is crooked unless I know what is straight? This is C.S. Lewis, what led him to faith as an atheist. Uh, he goes on to suggest this concerning the troubles of Job. Remember, I'm assuming you know the book of Job. Not Job. <laughs> Job. Let me he says this. This is him speaking. Let me suggest that the author of the book of Job takes the position which neither Job nor his friends take. Uh, he, Job, believes in the goodness, uh, in God's goodness and in Job's, Job's goodness, and he's prepared to give up his belief in proposition A, which is that God is all-powerful. Job's ready to give that up. Huh? Have you read Job? He says, bad things do happen to good people in this world, but it is not God who wills it. Oh. Uh, God would like people to get what they deserve in life, but he can't always arrange it. Why? By not Godism. He's limited in power. He is? He says, forced to choose between, this is Kushner, forced to choose between a God, a good God who is not totally powerful, or a powerful God who is not totally good, the author of the book of Job chooses to believe in God's goodness. I would say, why would you want to then? I mean, if God is not all powerful, how can he ever deal with anything? If he's not omniscient, then how can he be God? I mean, really, how could he ever even deal with evil if he's not God, who's all powerful and all knowing? That's his viewpoint of God. That's tenuous at best. Kushner's cosmos has a God ruling and reigning over it who gets caught off guard by things like the death of a son. Oh, I wasn't looking. Sorry. Your stove blows up. Oh, I was busy on another quadrant of the cosmos. No, no. What does Jeremiah say? God speaking. Here's God. Here's what he says. Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 27. God says, behold, I am the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, Yahweh. He's the covenant God. He's faithful. To his covenant. Like he's never going to break it. His word. He says, I am the God of all flesh. And then he asks a question. Is anything too difficult for me? What's the answer to the rhetorical question? No. Of course not. It's, nothing's too difficult for me. God, can you help me process the loss of a child? What's God say? That's a tough one. I can't help you with that. No. Nothing is too difficult for him. God, the, what happened to my Kenmore? It blew up. Can you help us find a black one? Maybe. No. What does he say? I don't only give you one. I'll give you a Shabbat oven. I mean, I'm still, still freaking out about that. It's amazing. I mean, just, and sometimes God just smiles on you just to show you the greatest things about himself. Isaiah says this about God. Verse 40, uh, chapter uh, 46, verse 9. God says, let me explain to you my greatness. Notice what he says. Remember the former things long past, for I am God, and there is no other. I am the God, and there's no one like me. If they claim to be God, they're not. How do you verify the fact that he's God? He tells you why in verse 10. Uh, I'm the one who's declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times the things which have not been done, saying my purpose, he always has one, will, all, will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. You cannot stop me to fulfill my will. What's he say? I have the ability to foretell the future with great precision. That's what he just said. I mean, go th what makes the Bible distinct from any book of all holy books? One main thing. It prophesies the future with precision hundreds and thousands of years before the fact. It's one of the reasons I'm a Christian. I mean, look at the evidence. It's statistically impossible for them to do that. And so he says, you want to know how great I am? I know all things. See, the God that you serve, the God that I serve, he knows all things. He's omniscient. He is all powerful. Nothing catches him off guard no matter what it is, which means his hand is on the wheel of your ship. You're not drifting aimlessly at sea. He's there to care for you down to the smallest of details out of his love for you. So I have to ask a question. Did you come in here with a diminished view of God? I mean, if you're honest. Yeah, I believe he's sovereign, but I kind of think like Kushner, there's times when I don't know that he's sovereign. No, he's sovereign all the time. He has to be sovereign to be able to defeat sin and evil one day. That's what he does. I read a story uh, some time ago, uh, and wow. It's one of those stories, it's like, that, that is, that is a, an, a moving story. I mean, it really, it just spoke to me at a great level about the sovereignty of God. It comes from a World War II story uh, from uh, Navy Annals, USS Astoria, sunk by the Japanese on August the 9th, 1942. 
Uh, it was a heavy uh, cruiser, offered su fire, fire support for the invasion of Guadalcanal, the Marines. Uh, Japanese attacked it around, uh, well, 0130. Uh, at 0200, as the ship is taking heavy shelling from uh, um, Japanese destroyers in the darkness, uh, there was a, a, a young man, a signalman third class. His name was Elgin Staples. He was near uh, one of the 8-inch turret guns when it took a direct hit. The, the force of the blast blew him into the ocean, into the darkness. He landed in the water and watched his ship get pummeled by Japanese destroyers. As he's floating in the water with his life belt that he managed to grab as he went over, as he's waiting in the water, he has to stay bobbing in the darkness for four hours as the battle ensued. At 0600, the USS Bagley, somebody on board saw him in the water and they fished him out of the water. He was so happy to be saved. He wasn't happy when that ship sunk and he wound up in the ocean a second time with the same life belt around his waist. He's bobbing in the water again, thinking all hope is lost. And then another ship comes by, USS President Jackson. Somebody sees him in the water. They fish him out and put him on the ship. He's now been saved two times by two Navy vessels and two times by the life belt around his waist. While he's on that ship drying off, he pops his life belt off and he begins to look at it. And on the back of it, it's stenciled and it reads this. Made by, manufactured by, Firestone Tire and Rubber Company. Where? Akron, Ohio. He's thinking to himself, this is bizarre. I'm from Akron. What's the probability that my life belt came from Akron, Ohio? There's no ocean there. Uh, the Navy gave him a shore leave because of what he'd gone through. And so he got his duffel bag, loaded it up, and he stuck the life belt in there. He took it with him because it had saved him two times. He showed up at uh, his, his house to see his, his, his mom and dad in Akron, Ohio. And here's what uh, the Navy uh, Museum page tells us about him when he got home. He says, after, I, uh, after a quiet, emotional welcome, uh, I sat with my mother in our kitchen, telling her about all my recent ordeal and hearing what had happened at home since I had gone away. My mother informed me that to do her part for the war effort, she had finally gotten a job. Where do thinking minds think she worked? <laughs> what say the spiritual section? What? <laughs> Goodyear? Where do you think she worked? She worked at Firestone. She worked at Firestone. Surprised, he said, when my mom said that, I jumped up and I grabbed my life belt from my duffel bag. Every Navy sailor has one, right? Ta-da! I put it on the table in front of her. And I said, take a look at that, Mom. And then I flipped it over. Oh, yeah, this is a Firestone life belt made right here in Akron, Ohio. And son, that serial number is my number. <laughs> Kid you not. I get chills every time I read that story. Is that not amazing? Now, what would an agnostic say? Well, it's my calculated observation that that was just by total chance <laughs> that that occurred. Are you kidding me? Akron, Ohio, Firestone Company, safety belt. It was his mother's belt? She saved her son and she didn't even know it. Isn't that an amazing thing? It leads to a question. Because to me, God's hand was upon that mom getting a job at that plant. And she was the head person to approve the belts. But it leads to a theological question that I leave you with as you head for lunch. Here's the question. You ready? Thank you. We got to work on those rhetorical questions. Thanks. Okay. Here's the question. If a mother can produce a life belt which would inadvertently save her loving son, what great things can occur in our lives when we're floating in the sea from adversity from the hand of a good, all-powerful, loving, omniscient God? Much greater things. Because he's not inadvertently taking care of anything. His hand is upon your life belt to guide you where he needs you to be. That's providence. Let's pray. God, thank you for your providence. What a mysterious, great thing. We don't really ponder about it too much. We do have times where we question it. But might we wrap our hearts and minds around 
how much you love us, and how down into the details of our lives you really are to protect us, to teach us, to guide us. May we grow in our understanding of your greatness and give you praise for who you are in Christ's name. Amen.